Okay, in this video capsule, what we're going to talk about are the three levels of timing information in speech acoustics. They're called envelope, periodicity, and fine structure. This gives us a pretty good and neat framework for understanding the different levels of temporal information in speech. And the short version of the story is that the fastest changes in the waveform are what we call fine structure, the slowest changes are what we call envelope, and the ones that are intermediate are what we call periodicity. So the point of this video is to introduce us to what they look like on the waveform and what speech characteristics that each one corresponds to. So let's start with this word nudge and look for the three levels of information. The first thing we can do is just get rid of the spectrogram because what we're talking about is timing information, which is really based on the waveform. Highlighted in red is the envelope, which just shows us the slow outline of the overall changes in intensity over the signal. So what we can do is just ignore all the detail underneath this and just sort of track the peaks in the waveform as they change across time. Within that envelope, we see evidence of periodicity. So these repeating elements that we see at a very regular systematic rate are evidence that we have a voiced sound. And so what they reflect is the rate of vocal fold vibration, which for adults is typically between 100 and 300 times per second. Also over here, even though it doesn't look quite as uh, detailed, we also have evidence of periodicity because all we see is a repeating pattern. As opposed to what we see at the end of the word, which is just the ch part, um, which doesn't contain any periodicity. It's just like noise with any, without any particular pattern in it. The final category is fine structure. And what we're talking about is not people who are fine, who have good bone structure, but all those little tiny details that correspond to all the high frequencies within the signal. And by high frequency, I mean high frequency. We have to take the signal and zoom in, way in to see some of this detail. And yes, I'm talking about all those tiny little ups and downs in the signal, both on the left and the right there, that correspond to the highest frequency changes. So these are our three different kinds of information. We see that we can have access to all three types at the same time. And so when we think about timing, it's really useful to qualify that we're talking about the envelope or the periodicity or the fine structure, just to convey to someone the kind of information and the scale that we're talking about. To get a sense of that scale, here's a full waveform where the envelope is again traced in red above the wave. And as you can see, all of this detail down in this purple box is all within this tiny little slice of the waveform. So if you can imagine having um, a lot of these boxes all strung across this whole waveform, um, you can imagine how many ups and downs and zero crossings in that waveform you wouldn't have to, to draw to draw the whole structure of it. The envelope, um, because it's slow, it doesn't give us all the information we need, but it does give us, you know, where the stressed syllables are because we can see how high the envelope reaches away from that, that center zero line. So we can see when syllables are stressed, and we'll have some examples of that later in this video. We can also see uh, duration of sounds because we can just measure the, the onset and offset of those major changes in the envelope. As we'll see in just a moment, we have cues for consonant voicing and consonant manner of articulation. But just to make sure we drive home the point of the separation between the envelope and the internal structure of the sound, what we have up top is what we call a modulated sine wave. So we can see that there's sine wave structure, but it also has this other sort of larger repeating pattern over top of it. And so if we draw another sine wave on top, we can see that we have two levels of detail, the envelope and the fine structure. So we want to understand the waveform on top, this complex one, as a combination of both of these levels of timing changes happening at the same time. If you look around on the internet, you'll also find this same kind of diagram just written in different languages. So this is something that's pretty well universally understood and is not just a property of speech, but of sound and any system, uh, any signal in general that changes over time at multiple timescales. If we look at a whole sentence, we see lots of different timing changes that I want to point out just so that we um, start to get an intuition for the things that we'll look for. So for example, here we have an aperiodic a sound. We have some silent gaps, which is, you can think of this as a modulation in the temporal envelope. I mean, it, it doesn't have a lot of shape, but the fact that it goes down to zero is in fact the shape of the waveform right there. 
we can see that in this sentence, because the word loud is the emphasis, uh, the, the emphasized syllable, uh, that's where we see the envelope have its greatest excursion from that zero line. We can see the softest syllable, the syllable for the word for um, its envelope is really, you know, not quite very large. And then the last word in the sentence pleasure, because it has two syllables, we see two modulations, and we can see just from the envelope, which syllable is the stressed one because it's the one that's, you know, the largest and the loudest. So there's a lot of information we can get from the envelope. None of the stuff we've pointed at uh, that we've pointed out here lets us know the exact phoneme or the exact syllable that we're seeing. But it still gives us information like the presence of uh, stop sounds and fricative sounds, where the stress is within a word, how many syllables there are, and which one is emphasized. So we have a good start at the information that could be relevant. So let's dig in a little bit on uh, the use of envelope for manner of articulation. So you'll recall that sounds that have a different manner of articulation, what that means is that they have different amounts of uh, constriction of the airflow. And because that airflow constriction determines the envelope or the loudness of the sound over time, um, we should expect that these sounds, because they have different manners of articulation, they should produce different envelopes. So for ta, sa, cha, da, la, and na, we get distinctly different uh, waveforms that correspond to them. So even though we can't see any of the particular frequencies in this waveform, what we can see if we just outline the shape of them with the envelope is that they all have a very distinct shape. And this is not by accident. So this is actually a systematic change. Starting from the left, uh, we st we're starting from the zero line where it's flat, we get a very rapid rise of that envelope. And then eventually we see the periodicity in the envelope where we, we get into the vowel. But compare that to sa, where the change over time is really much more gradual. For cha, we have something intermediate to those. For da, we have a rapid onset, but it's not very long until it gets into the vowel. La, we have periodicity all throughout. And then for na, we'll get into this a little bit later, but we have is um, two levels of intensity. So pointing down here, we have this first segment for the N sound, and then the vowel comes in later with a lot more intensity. So these patterns tend to be pretty uh, indicative of the exact kind of manner that we're thinking about. So for this class, what I want you to do is not necessarily commit to memory the exact envelope shape of every phoneme, but to commit to memory the idea that as we change the manner of articulation, we can, we can see that change and measure that change as a difference in the envelope of the sound. Conversely, if I say the envelope of the sound has changed, you might be able to guess maybe the manner of articulation of the sound has changed. We just want to link those two properties together, the linguistic organizational principle of manner of articulation and the acoustic uh, property of the, the envelope. So I mentioned the word periodicity. This is the next level of, uh, of, of fast changes. So this is faster than um, the envelope changes. We're thinking about things you know, technically between 50 and 500 would all count as periodicity. For adults, as I was saying before, we're looking at things mainly in the in the low hundreds. So uh, this can cue the presence of voicing because anytime you have a periodic sound, it's reflecting the periodic um, vibration of the larynx or the vocal folds in the larynx. And what we can gain from this is a, a, a cue for the intonation or the pitch contour of a sentence. So let's take this sentence and divide it into sections that vary by uh, periodicity. You'll notice that um, the periodic segments are all um, uh, identified by the word yes, and where we see the word no, we have uh, the lack of periodicity. And that includes parts of the sound like here where we really don't have much sound because there's a little stop gap there. But all the parts where we have yes periodicity, they tend to be louder, okay, and they also um, show this systematic rate of repetition. So the presence of voicing gives us the presence of that systematic repetition. So let's zoom into that a little bit and see what information we can see. So we have two different periodic sounds on the screen, okay? And so what I want to draw your attention to is that there's a slower rate of repetition, there's more time in between on the left side, and there's not as much time in between on the right side. So because there's a faster rate of repetition on the right side, this would be a higher voice pitch, or what we describe acoustically as a higher fundamental frequency. So from this, you probably wouldn't be able to tell without a lot of work, 
exactly what frequency it is, and of course you can't tell it all from this image because I haven't labeled the axes with any numbers, but even though you don't know exactly what frequency it is, you can still tell that the signal on the right has a higher frequency than the signal on the left. So the final thing we'll show here is just a, a flipping back and forth between the envelope and the periodicity. So right here, you'll notice that a lot of the detail within the signal is just totally blocked out. And if we look at the periodicity, then uh, we're seeing some of that detail. Now we're still too zoomed out to see all of that detail, all the fine structure, but we can see that the, the envelope changes that would contrast these different phonemes like ch, sh, m, w, b, and p, these are all recoverable in the envelope. And then by looking at the periodicity, we can see that in her bull and her work, that periodicity continues all the way through, but in her pool and her chop and her ship, then we're looking at the, the lack of periodicity in that middle. So what this corresponds to is the fact that ch, sh, and p are not voiced sounds. Anytime we have a voiced sound in the middle, like m, w, and b, then we have a, the continuity of periodicity all throughout the sound. So the final thing to go over here is fine structure. Um, there's not as much that we'll say about this because this is really getting into the, the real nitty gritty details of speech. And we tend to think about um, these high frequency cues as being something we look at on a spectrum or a spectrogram. But still, um, we want to learn what, what we look for in the signal in the fine structure and how it could be relevant. So specifically, when we think about things between 600 and 10,000 hertz, we're thinking about cues to what it is, what vowel it is that you're hearing. What is the vowel identity? And also, what is the consonant place of articulation? We've thought about uh, consonant voicing and consonant manner, but even if you know the voicing and the manner, so if I said you're listening to a voiced stop sound, you still don't know what sound you're hearing. And so to tell the difference between a b, d, and g sound, as we have here, you actually need to look at the fine structure of the sound, because those are where the details are that differentiate place of articulation. You'll notice that, you know, this just looks like a random pattern, and it's true. It's really difficult to see fine structure differences on a waveform in any kind of meaningful way, and usually what we'd look at is a spectrogram uh, to look at the differences between these sounds. So in future videos, when we're looking at consonant features, when we think about ba, da, and ga, we're not just going to look at waveforms because that's going to be really too difficult to separate these sounds. Um, and instead, we'll look at frequency patterns um, based on the spectrogram. So that's it for this video. Um, we've learned about envelope, periodicity, and fine structure. And the next uh, capsule, what we'll look at is the source filter model of vowel production.